Okay, you can buy some tools. It's the poor craftsman that blames his or her tools. It's an old proverb that's meant to make you feel like if your project doesn't go the way you want it to, you can't say it was the tool's fault, it's really only your fault. And I feel like that's a common belief amongst people, but I feel like most people are wrong. I think that it does have something to do with the tools that you use if a project doesn't turn out well, to an extent. What I think it really means is that it's the inexperienced craftsperson or woodworker or novice or whatever that selects the wrong tools for the job because they don't have the experience and acquired skill to select the right tools. So if you've never framed a building before and you went to the hardware store and picked out a hammer and you grabbed this one, you might think that it is absolute garbage after just a few swings. And it, it kind of is. It's not a garbage hammer, but it's a garbage hammer for what you're trying to do. But if you've spent even a few days on a framing crew and gained that practice of driving home a bunch of 16 penny nails, the next time you go to the hardware store, you're gonna grab the right hammer. You're gonna grab a framing hammer that has a much wider head. It's not as small in diameter as this. It'll have serrations here or cut lines in it to give it a little bit of tooth. And it'll be a little bit longer, a little bit heavier in the head. One is not better than the other necessarily, but one is much better suited to a specific task than the other. I wish I had a framing hammer to show you, but I'm sure you can use your imagination and get an idea of what I'm talking about. It's not so much to do with born ability as it is with experience and acquired knowledge and practice. So get the whole, he's a natural woodworker out of your head. How can we select the right tools to purchase if we have limited experience in what we're selecting them for? The easiest answer to that is to look to the past. There are almost always in any craft or field set tools that have been around since the dawn of that craft that are still in use today. So in woodworking, good examples would be bits and braces or drill brits, drill brits, dill, dill, dill bits, drill bits, hand saws, both Japanese and Western, squares, bevel gauges, hammers, hand planes, hand chisels. Honestly, and in any modern woodworking shop for the most part, you're still gonna find those tools in use in one form or another. The plane might be really fancy like some of the stuff from Bridge City Toolworks, but in, in its essence and core, it's still a wooden plane. It's not made out of wood. Another place to look is to the pros and semi-pros in the field that you're interested in. Pay attention to their content, either here on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or wherever, and really look for the tools that they're using over and over again. Chances are if you're seeing them use a track saw more often than a table saw, there's probably something to that. I use a bandsaw in almost every single one of my videos. Really do some thinking though about what it is you're gonna be doing in the shop. If you're gonna be producing a set of cabinets every month, you might want to invest early on in a really nice cabinet grade table saw. If not, you might not need a table saw. <gasps> no table saw, Mr. Crafts Rights lost his mind. The other thing to look for is tools with multiple uses, like routers, bandsaws, drill presses, a really good circular saw those sorts of things. Because if, even if you select the wrong tool for the project at hand, more than likely at some point in the future, that tool will be the right tool for another project. The multi-purpose and multifunctionality of them is super, super valuable. I think routers and bandsaws are some of the most valuable things that you can buy early on. So invest in good ones if you can. A jack plane is an awesome example of a multifunctional tool that doesn't cost you a ton, but can get you a lot of work done. It's called that because it's supposed to be the jack of all trades. Now this is a cheap one from Amazon, but it's gotten me by really well over the last couple of years. They call it a jack of all trades because, or a jack plane, because it takes the place of not only a jointer plane, it's long enough to get that job sort of done, not quite as long as this number seven, a scrub plane with a wide mouth, and you can actually change, get a second iron for this, change it out and camber the blade like this one is. And then by adjusting the frog, this part here, or putting a little bit, another blade in, you can also use it as a smoothing plane, like a number four. So this one tool eliminates the need for all of these. Now don't get me wrong, if you have the space for these and you have the money and you like playing around with old planes, get all the planes that you want. But if you're just getting going, don't worry about most of this stuff. Just get a nice jack plane, get comfortable with it, learn how to use it, learn how to sharpen it, and then move on to some of these other. Although I will say that 
this little scrub plane that I converted from a cheap cobalt from Lowe's, there's a video up there, is an awesome little plane for dimensioning stock. And then this number seven, if you ever run across one at a garage sale, I think I got this for 15 bucks, get it. It has made some extremely flat boards for me. But how much should we invest in one of these tools if we're just gaining experience? Buy a forever tool if you can. If you have the shop space and the wallet for it, buy the biggest and best possible. You'll almost always be able to get your money out of it if you ever change your mind. But also don't be afraid to punch a little bit under your weight class. Don't go out and punch people, but you know what I mean. But if you're just starting out, I would wanna warn you not to go out and buy tools that get rid of necessary skill building exercises. A good example would be the Festool Domino. Awesome tool, awesome, awesome, badass tool. It takes something that to like a mortise and tenon that normally would take about 15 or 20 minutes to do by hand and reduces it down to 20 seconds. It makes a very boring and labor intensive job, very fast and fun, which is great. If you need one, if you have a project coming up and you absolutely need it by 100% go out and get it. But if you're just getting started, this, this is for new people in the game. Don't go out and buy a Festool Domino before that you cut, before, the, before you've cut your teeth on actually cutting one by hand because you're robbing yourself of the experience of learning how a mortise and tenon should be cut, how it can be cut by hand, and how to use those tools, gain the dexterity. Obviously, if you have something hindering you from doing that, like a handicap or an aversion to chisels, but you're okay with spinning routers, do you. But if you can, at least cut your teeth or learn to chisel a mortise and tenon a couple times by hand before you go out and buy a mortise and a mortise and tenon before you buy a Festool Domino that cuts floating mortise and tenons for you. That's just my opinion. You also don't have to buy brand new. And in fact, in some cases, like I think bits and braces, you can't buy them brand new. I think you can, but they're not very good. You don't have to buy brand new. There's the usual suspects like Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, OfferUp, etc., where you can find good deals on used tools. eBay is kind of hit and miss, I feel like, because there are so many eyeballs on the items that it's really hard for them to go as a steal. Most people know what they're looking for and are savvy enough to go there and, and pay for an item. In my area, the local woodworking guild puts on estate sales for other woodworkers that are trying to liquidate some of their old or unused tools. And it's honestly a really great place to find some good deals. In fact, I went to one of those sales the other day and came away with the tools that I showed you with the price tags on them. I got all of those for $28, which I think is a crazy good deal because you could do some serious projects with just a handsaw, a bit and brace. My first set of chisels, like really nice ones that I bought was from one of those Guild estate sales. And I think I paid 40 or 50 bucks for a full set of Robert Sorby chisels, which it's not a huge household name like Lee Nielsen anymore, but they're good chisels and they were brand new, never touched. You could tell they had never been used. So I think this is an extremely valuable resource. And if you can find some of these in your area, if your local guild does this, or even if there's a local company that does a monthly or bi-monthly woodworking tools estate sale, make it part of your routine to go to those sales. You'll never really know what you're going to find. And you might find some sort of hidden gem that you didn't know you needed. They also had some great prices on larger equipment, like a really nice heavy delta joiner and a really nice grizzly table saw, among a few other things. There were several woodworkers there that were just starting to build out their shops and were using tools from these sales to do so. Look into your local woodworking guild to see if they do something like that. If not, estate sales are also a great place to find tools. That jack plane that I paid 15 bucks, I think it was for, that was just a garage sale about three blocks from my house. I was driving by one day, stopped there and said, oh, hey, you take 15 for it, I think the guy wanted 20. So I didn't knock him down too much, but you know, it's a garage sale, you gotta try. Now the most important question that all of you want answered is why are you filming outside in 100 degree weather? The short answer is my shop is too full of junk and it's too hot in there, it's an oven. The long answer is I did the thing that I think a lot of new woodworkers do and I was guilty of it, where I went out and I bought all the tools before I actually focused on the fundamentals of setting up a good shop space in my shop. I went out and got everything that I thought I needed. And before I knew it, my shop was so full that I could hardly move around in it. And I neglected the things that I should have taken care of before I put tools in there, like insulating the walls and putting some sort of climate control in. I got caught up in the buying rush of, I need the tool, I need the tool, I need the other tool, I need that tool. 
you don't need all the tools. You need tools 100% unless you want to go out and chop the wood by hand, which I'm sure some of you might be able to do. And if you do, I want to see it. It'd be pretty neat. But be diligent and thoughtful in your tool purchases so that you can be violent and active in your projects. I know there's a saying that has something to do with that. I like it. I just can't remember it off the top of my head. I also have a little bit of hoarder in my blood, but I'm working on it. Now I'm to the point where I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is and I'm actually prepping to sell off the majority of my shop. I'm still gonna keep some of those forever tools that we talked about, like my bandsaw, and it's really kind of about it. Everything else is sort of up in the air and on the chopping block. I might get rid of my table saw. I might get rid of my miter saw. I know that I'm gonna to try to get rid of my joiner and planer and combine them into one machine because I don't need all that room taken up. Yeah, it takes a little bit longer to transition the machine from jointer to planer mode, but the amount of space that it saves and the amount of space that it creates is more valuable in my opinion than having two separate machines I can just And that money will get reinvested into fixing up the shop, adding insulation, all that sort of stuff. And I'll be using the skill and knowledge that I've acquired over the last couple years to purchase tools that I should have bought when I first started and not go crazy and think, oh, I have to have that thing in order for this project to turn out right. It's another robbing or theft, I think, from our experience when we think that we have to have a tool to do a project. And if we have that particular tool, we can do that project particularly well. In some cases it's true, but the whole thing about crafting and building with your hands is you need to m exercise and work your imagination and creativity and problem solving. And if you just go out and buy a tool that does it for you every single time you run into a little bit of a problem, you're genuinely robbing yourself of a growth experience or an experience in general. You may not grow, you may regress from it, but you've robbed yourself of it and that's a shame. In the meantime, we'll get to enjoy some lovely outdoor filming and projects while that is getting taken care of. And if you'd like me to film the process of organizing the shop and having a garage sale and repurchasing new tools and whatnot, let me know down in the comments below. If you're a patron of mine on Patreon, you'll probably see the behind the scenes footage anyway. And make sure you're subscribed because in the next video, we're gonna be taking some of those tools that I bought at that estate sale and start building the future of the new shop. And until then, keep up the good work. You guys okay?